Hi and welcome back to another video. Today again RTX 4090 coverage. We will be looking at the streaks and in particular if more voltage will help higher clocks. We previously covered the Founders Edition during launch and also the Aorus Master. During the Aorus Master content when we tried overclocking we saw that in 99% of the cases we are not power limited. Most of these cards allow up to 600 watt power target and even during benchmarking you will typically only see a power consumption of maybe 480 to 520 watt. Usually cannot reach the 600 watt power draw. Which means that we still have some headroom but it also looks like we are voltage limited. Jay also had the same findings in his video. That's why we will try to hook up the Elmore EBC which is basically a tool that allows communication with for example a notebook and the voltage controller of our Strix. And it should be quite interesting to see if more voltage helps and then maybe we can see higher clocks than just three gigahertz. Generally speaking, the Strix is quite impressive because this weights 2.5 kilogram. And even though the Auros Master already exceeds the volume of the Founders Edition by 70%, the Auros Master is not quite heavier. It's about 100 grams heavier than the Founders Edition, so this is about 2.2 kilogram and the Auros Master is about 2.3 kilogram. But this is 2.5. Even though this is lower volume than the Auros Master, so that's quite interesting. It has quite a bit more aluminium parts on it, like the back plate and some frame on here, which definitely accounts to the weight. But also the heatsink is a bit bigger, so that should be quite interesting and hopefully gives us enough cooling headroom with increased voltage. One quick note on the appearance of the Strix 4090 because honestly when I saw this card first time like several months ago in some render images I was not sure if I like or dislike this new design. But I have to admit that now I have the card in front of me it just looks so much better in reality. Especially because the entire part on the back is also made out of aluminium. Only the rear part of the Strix looks a bit low quality to me at least when it's not powered on. I'm not a big fan of this transparent acrylic part which you can see on here. It kind of reminds me of the GTX 285 Classified from EVGA from like 12 years ago. But it definitely changes once the card is sitting inside the system or at least once it's powered on because then the acrylic part in the back is illuminated with RGB and that looks quite good. Same goes for this part on here. On some images I really didn't like it because it looked kind of cheap but in reality if you have it in front of you I really like it. It's a really good design. Pretty nice card. Also quick note on the vapor jamber. This seems to be something new because most typical vapor jambers will just have the part that is sitting down like the actual vapor jamber and then you have the heat pipes probably soldered on but here they have a huge chunk of copper just on top of it and they milled some grooves in there and then added the heat pipes in there. At least according to ASUS this should help performance. So cooling yeah, could be quite interesting on the Strix. As you can see I already removed the backplate of the card and this is already revealing some very nice features that come with the Strix. First of all we have voltage measurement points. Just starting with 12 volt external power that should be for the external connector. We also have 12 volt over the PC Express bus, we have GPU voltage, we have 1.8 volt, we have the memory voltage. So all these features are very helpful when it comes to testing and debugging what we want to do in today's video. Right in front on the left we should get the points for accessing the GPU voltage controller that is sitting on the front. But as I already said I don't want to remove the cooler right now. That will be something to do later. In front we should have measurement points. Either they are labeled in front or not labeled at all. If they are for voltage that's what I'm going to find out in a second. I will probably add this small multimeter. That's also something I ordered a while ago from the Elmore shop and should be quite helpful just to control if the voltage is actually applied or not. For this kind of testing and purpose I usually find it very helpful to work with a riser cable. You can simply put the card on the table like this. Even cooling wise as long as there is no high load this is totally fine. Just to get some voltage readings and just maybe also soldering on the card. You don't always have to take it in and out of the system so that's quite helpful. Also one thing I'm not quite sure why Asus decided to reverse this connector once again. That's quite annoying because this is not going to fit in today's video, unfortunately, for power reading. We will obviously also add a reversed version later once it comes available, but for now we will not be able to track the power right of the cable. The card is in idle, we're not doing any benchmarks or anything. 
but right now I just want to get some baseline numbers on the voltages. So memory voltage in idle seems to be 1.35 and on the GPU that's 0.98 and PEX is 0.90. And now if we just go to the points that are not labeled, this could be ground as well. So that's 0.99, that should be the GPU voltage. 1.338, that's definitely the memory voltage, and then that should be the PEX voltage. So those are definitely voltage measurement points, at least the three in front, not quite sure about the other three, but that should be quite good for us to maybe hook up the voltage readout device. I'm going to steal 12 volt from this top tiny capacitor. Right now I'm not quite sure which of the connectors is actually doing what, because it's only labeled with plus, minus, and C, but probably the white one that is labeled with C will be the supply with 12 volt and ground is obvious and the other one should probably be the measurement. Right now not much should happen. I guess it will just power on and then if we want to measure we can just probe it on here and see if it works out. Alright, that looks good. We'll now attach it to uh, GPU voltage and then we can always read out what's happening on the card. It's time to attach the data connection for the EVC. The square one should be SEL, center should be ground, bottom SDA. You can identify ground unfortunately easily because all the heat is straight going into the PCB and soldering is yeah, quite annoying. Seems like we need a bit more power to change to a different soldering iron. Now just made the cable connection to the EVC. On the I2C connection 1, if you check find devices, I also found the MP2891 on address 20. As you can see, it then disappeared later and I manually added it afterwards. But just going over here and then enabling monitoring, you can see output power 0.98 volts. So that's totally in line with the expected GPU V core. Seems like that is already working. The only question is if we can actually apply a voltage. So I'm changing to an offset of 100 millivolt, apply changes, and then if it works out, we should be able to see it on the. Yeah, that looks great. So that's 0.05. That is basically what we can get also by just adjusting in like GPU tweak. So I guess we give the card some load and force it into 3D mode. For the quick test purpose, I configured 3D Mark to perform a loop test of the GT1 in a lower resolution. This causes the GPU to get a little bit less load. You can see it's only about 40% TDP. That's a bit easier on the GPU in case something goes wrong with the voltage. It shouldn't be that terrible. GPU voltage was typically between 1 and 1.05 volts, so that's pretty much stock and the GPU temperature is still quite low because the card is still facing downwards. Went back to the EVC on stock. As you can see, that is pretty much the highest we can get without EVC adjustments. That is just by dragging up the voltage slider in GPU tweak to the max. And I guess to figure out if the EVC is working, we should see voltages of about 1.2 volt. Now that's really exciting. The card is now running with about 1.12 volt. That is still stock, but I now mounted it correctly. The 3D Mark is still running in a loop with a lower resolution 1080p simply to keep the load on the GPU a little bit lower. It's currently at about 40% GPU load. We have about 30 to 40, sometimes 50% TDP on the card. And we now want to pay attention to both TDP voltage or all three of them and also power draw when I apply the offset of the Elmo EVC. The result is a strong increase in board power draw. We can see about 500 watt, where previously we only saw about 260. Interestingly though, we cannot see the voltage picked up in the GPU voltage down there. It's still reading 1.1, but yeah, it's a strong increase in power draw and also strong increase in uh, GPU temperature. That's how we can definitely see that the voltage has to be applied. Another very good indicator is that we can see almost 1.2 volt read out over the digital multimeter. But a big question that remains is if we can gain higher clocks than previously. Currently 2900 megahertz. 
seems still quite difficult to increase the clock further depending on the exact position in the benchmark scene. This also at the end of the test it drops down all the way to 2600 megahertz. But I mean that's already quite nice. For an air-cooled card that is the highest I've seen so far I think. 3060? 3075? I spent a few more hours testing and trying to max out the GPU and at least in a 1080p setting I could reach clocks above 3100 megahertz. That is quite impressive. Like 3120 is something I could see. But the thing is if I try to run like the 4K setting, it will immediately always hit the power limit. So we are not only in a voltage limit, what we thought earlier, but we are at the same time also in the power limit because if you run the card stock or like with increased power target, increased voltage slider just out of the software, we are hitting the voltage limit. But if we then over Elmer EVC increase the voltage, just, just like 50 millivolt is enough, it will immediately hit the power limit. And then you cannot get the 3100 or above megahertz stable because the power limit is reached and then the card clocks down in my case somewhere between 3 gigahertz and like 30, 60 megahertz. Yeah, that means we will definitely have to do, have to perform a power limit mod. That is something I did not expect because I thought the 600 watt power target would be enough on a 4090 but seems like at least with slightly increased voltage that's not the case. But I also fear that above 600 watt we probably also have to upgrade the cooling. With air cooling, this is impressive, it really is impressive how much heat the cooler can dissipate and still maintain like 65 degrees Celsius at like 580 to 600 watt. But if we increase the voltage further I think it might be a good idea to lower the temperatures maybe with water cooling to like 40 degrees Celsius or something like that. This behavior reminds me of something Optimum Tech found a few days ago. He did a video about undervolting on the 3090. And if he lowered the voltage basically too much, even with the same clocks, he could see a performance decrease. And that's also something I could observe here. Because in some cases, I still had the same clock with the increased voltage, but the performance was worse than without the additional voltage. So seems not to be that easy to track. So much about this video. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.